Okay, guys, so today the content that will be covered is critical neurological illnesses, and this is going to primarily be centered around TIAs and strokes. So our learning objectives are as follows. So make sure you understand the care and the priority for each of those cares related to a stroke. And also um, evidence-based care for a stroke. What kind of interventions do we need to do? Um, we're going to also talk about some of the medications that we will be using. So here we go. Let's roll. Make sure you study your learning objectives. So what is a TIA? Let's kind of just start with this. So the word transient, transient ischemic attack, the word transient really means that it's going to be temporary. It's like comes and goes. So what happens is we have a brief interruption of blood flow to the um, vessels of the brain. And when that happens, patients will have symptoms that are going to be very similar to what we see in a stroke but they may resolve. Usually they actually resolve within 30 to 60 minutes, but they're pretty much completely gone within 24 hours. If you have repeated TIAs, you ha may have brain injury or permanent brain damage. The most important thing to think about with these patients, if you see a patient that's having some symptoms and then they go away, they are at very high risk for actually having um, a stroke. Sometimes TIAs are referred to as mini strokes. So if you hear a patient say, or in the clinic, they say that I've had mini strokes, this will be what they are referring to. So what do we really look like? So if these symptoms are transient, you may see them or may not by the time they arrive to the hospital. Or you may note them and then the doctor comes by and they're no longer present. So oftentimes as new nurses, we struggle with, you know, like, do I really know what I'm doing? Is this like the truth? But nobody says anything about this in the chart. So, man, it looks like her face is drooping or maybe it looks like her gait is messed up, but I don't see anywhere in the chart it says that. Go with what you see. Believe in yourself. Document your findings. Let the physician know or the provider know, hey, this patient's complaining all of a sudden they got blurred vision and then he comes by later and this patient ain't got no blurred vision what's wrong with you think about TIA or they may have double vision they may have diplopia where they're seeing two like why are there two nurses in here or um they're gonna they'll have that numbness and vertigo so all of a sudden your patient says the room seems like it's spinning when they go to get up uh, they may have some speech deficits where they have some aphasia or they might have some dysarthria so if we're thinking about aphasia, what is aphasia? Aphasia is just problem with speech or language. So that would be your aphasia. So what would be your dysarthria? It would just mean that your patient is slurring their speech. So they're having a hard time getting their words out because it's so slurred. And the slurring is actually because they have facial weakness or either paralysis. Uh, there are some key feature, features mentioned in your book, and I will go back and review those key features. So what tests will we most likely run on a patient that presented with the symptoms of a TIA and or a stroke? So look over these and think about them for a second. We covered uh, neurological assessments and, the, and certain tests, but I want you to think about why each of these would be important. What would you find if you did an ECG or EKG? What are you looking for? I hope you guys said AFib because remember AFib is one of the high risk associated with strokes and or TIAs. Also a CT. What would you see if the patient had a CT? Well, you may not see anything, or you may see that there's um, been having them for off and on for a while, and you may start to see that there's been brain tissue that has um, atrophied because or had changes to it because they are not getting blood flow or haven't had blood flow for a while. Remember, we could do the MRI or an MRA to actually look at the brain tissue itself. 
and then you might want to do an ultrasound. So what would you do an ultrasound of? Well, we're not going to do an ultrasound of the brain, like you can't really look through the bone to see what's going on. But you could do an ultrasound of those arteries, the carotid arteries and the vertebral arteries that actually feed the brain to see if there's blockages in there and see if there's any chance that the patient um, has something that would be causing them to have these symptoms. So what are we going to do for these patients? So they had a TIA, it resolved. What are, what are some of the goals that we have for these patients? The goal is to prevent them from having strokes and from having additional TIAs. So patients that are at most risk for TIAs or is a common risk is hypertension. So if hypertension is a risk factor and we want to prevent it from happening, let's control their blood pressures. Your antihypertensives. Um, so also we want to put these patients on blood thinners. So they're going to be on aspirin or clopidogrel, which is your platelet, uh, agri antiplatelet, to prevent those platelets from sticking together, causing further clots. Diabetes, we want them to stay in range. So we're going to shoot for a goal between 100 and 180. Now, if they're in the hospital, we're going to still stay within that 140 to 180. Remember, we don't want to be too aggressive, but these are things that we're going to uh, try to teach them to do at home. Let's stay between 100 and 180 at home. And then the other thing is, you know, of course, those lifestyle changes. Y'all are right. If you think about lifestyle changes, it's those same things you've heard with cardiac. It's those same things you've heard with hypertension. Let's don't smoke. Let's eat healthy. Let's exercise. So think about those in the same manner that you would um, for a TIA. So a couple of medicines that I want you guys to understand would be your aspirin and your clopidogrel. You've heard them all the way through nursing school, so they must be pretty important. Remember aspirin, the side effects of aspirin, what would you teach your patients, and then the interactions that they may have with other medicines. So, you know, if you've got a patient on an aspirin and they're also on a beta blocker, which is common, the beta blocker is going to decrease... Um, the aspirin is going to decrease the effectiveness of that beta blocker. So think about those kind of things when you're when you're giving your patients medications. For clopidogrel, you also want to think about um, some of the side effects that are related to it. And that for both of these, you're going to make sure that you are uh, monitoring for bleeding. So bleeding precautions with these patients. Some of the PPIs like Nexium can actually inhibit clopidogrel, so make sure that your patient is not on Nexium if they're on Plavix. So if that's a TIA, a transient ischemic stroke, so that could potentially be just temporary. But a stroke, this is where you actually have the a brain attack. It means the brain is not getting perfused to the point that the brain tissue is starting to die. This is also called a CVA, which is a cerebrovascular accident. So if you ever see um, CVA listed in your patient's chart, that would indicate a stroke. So if the blood misses its oxygen or its uh, blood sugar, even for just a few minutes, that part of the brain is going to start to die because there's no storage of oxygen and glucose in the brain. It will also cause the buildup of CO2 and lactic acid, and this is going to happen really quickly. So that's what you're, that's what the things that you're looking for. Uh, when a patient does have a stroke, remember it's going to be contralateral, so it's going to be on the opposite side. You can also have uh, a buildup of waste that's going to cause the brain to swell, and then once that swelling occurs, you can actually see that the patient is having symptoms on both sides, but don't let that confuse you to which side the actual stroke occurred. So if we think that as the swelling increases, we may see some symptoms initially, but they may change or they may um, just be one side and then they move to both sides. That could be a secondary result of uh, edema within the brain. So here on this picture, you can actually see there's two different kinds of stroke. There's one where you actually have a blockage, and then there's one where you have a rupture. And we're going to talk about those now.
So for the blockage, the ischemic stroke from a blockage is caused either by a thrombi or an emboli. So remember that a thrombi is an actual clot, and this is a result of over the years of having high blood pressure, having high cholesterol, um, atherosclerosis starts to build up in the intracranial or um, the carotids or the intervertebral arteries. Now this is going to happen over time. So you're going to see a slower onset of these, these type symptoms. However, for the embolic, embolic, it doesn't have to be a blood clot. It can be anything that travels from another part of the body. So it could be a, a clot that came from the lungs because of aphid, or it could be a air emboli. Maybe the patient was having a heart catheter, they injected air. It could be uh, a fat emboli like with, with the PEs that could travel there. It could be a foreign body like they were doing a procedure and it got loose and went up there. So emboli is anything that moves from another part of the body. These characteristics are going to be, I was sitting here one minute and then the next minute all these things happen. These symptoms can resolve over several hours to days if the clot breaks down and the body starts absorbing it. However, they don't always. So that's just a potential. Um, the other thing you have to think about is when you have something that is stopped the blood flow from going to an area, that blood behind there is still pushing. So there's still pressure behind that artery. And so this puts your patient at a risk for actually having a hemorrhagic stroke behind where the actual blood clot happens. So they could have a blockage, pressure builds up behind that blockage, and then it actually causes that vessel to rupture. So those will be your ischemic blockages. And there's also a chart in your book for this. Now a hemorrhagic stroke it's not a blockage that's the problem. These patients are actually hemorrhaging. They're actually bleeding. So this means that the patient has had a blood vessel that has ruptured, and now they're not getting blood flow past that because it's kind of like a water hose. If it starts breaking off and leaking out at one spot, you're not getting good water out the other end. Well, that's kind of how it is with the hemorrhagic stroke. So there's, there's two kinds. There can be an intracerebral, and that's where the bleeding actually goes into the brain tissue itself. Um, these are the ones that can actually cause displacement of the brain tissue. Often this is from your severe hypertension patients and either uh, drug use, especially cocaine. Now the subarachnoid stroke, this one is the one that happens very suddenly and the patients are gonna complain classic symptom classic symptom, in parentheses, classic symptom, is the worst headache of my life. And this is usually caused from an aneurysm where the vessel gets weak and starts kind of having these little outpatchings from a weak spot, or a genetic uh, AV malformation, which is where the two vessels start coming together, like, um, like an intersection of a road kind of sort of, the vessels kind of intersect and it's not properly formed or trauma. It can also be caused from trauma. And what they're going to often have is they're going to have nausea and vomiting. They'll have photophobia. They'll have cranial nerve deficits, including a stiff neck and a change in their mental status. So this is also could potentially have a, a very poor outcome and a poor prognosis. It's just determined, it's determined by the extent of the bleed itself. So this is what it might look like. So this one on, you can see that this is an intracerebral hemorrhage over here. And in this one, you can actually see that the blood is pooling in the tissue here, where on this side over here, this one is not going into the tissues because it is outside that lining of the brain there. And then this is what it would look like when the artery actually burst because the the vessel outpouched. You see because there's a weak spot here where it actually outpouched. So who's at risk for a stroke? 
what patients would you think would be at high risk for an actual stroke? I'm going to suggest you guys go in and review those risk factors. We've actually already covered some of them. Um, family history, there would be obesity, hypertension, of course, diabetes, high cholesterol, those kind of things. Alcohol, substance abuse, contraceptives. So just go back and look in your book at the risk and know which ones are modifiable and which ones are non-modifiable. When patients have a stroke, time is critical. So it's like, just like a heart attack, you can have a brain attack. And the quicker you get blood flow back to the brain, it's going to determine a lot of times the outcomes your patients have, the long-term effects they have. Uh, disability from a stroke is a major, major problem that patients have to endure. So let's get them to a hospital and let's do the right thing for them initially. So the number one priority is getting this patient to a stroke center to evaluate them for fibrolinic therapy. Because the longer you delay that fibrolinic therapy, the worse the patient is going to have as far as their outcomes. So we got to know, is this truly a stroke? So we're going to do a quick focused assessment. We're going to ask some questions like, have you had a recent bleed? Are you taking any blood thinners? We're going to know like how the symptoms started, what was the patient doing? And then we're also going to rule out other things like was it their blood sugar that might be low? Were they on some medicines that might be causing these symptoms? This is normal for them. And then we're going to rush the patient to a CT. So we're not going to delay anything to getting that CT. Getting that CT to see if they're actually bleeding or not is so important to patient survival. Uh, this may be one of your core measures. This may be one of your uh, quality improvement projects at the hospital. After we get all that done, we do our assessment. Then we'll determine uh, is the patient a candidate for fibrolinic therapy or not. If they are, there's some very strict protocols that we're going to talk about in a minute that we have to follow. If they are, if they're not, what would be some reasons that they would not be a candidate? Some of the reasons that they wouldn't be a candidate is number one, if it truly wasn't a stroke, it was a low blood pressure, low blood sugar, or if it was a hemorrhagic. So if it's a hemorrhagic stroke, we're definitely not going to give the fibrolinic therapy. But also, um, how long ago did it start happening? That would be an impact to determine if they are uh, um, a candidate or not. Because fibrolinic therapy, it has to be given within three to four and a half hours from the time the symptom first began. So you got to know when did these symptoms begin? When was the last time somebody actually saw this person well without symptoms? So there are a few things we have to know. And then we'll talk in a minute about some of the... Um, reasons patients can't receive the TPA or the um, fibrolinate therapy. All right, so what do we want to know? When it began? Well, I was hanging out with my buddies and all of a sudden we had some cocaine. Oh, okay, that gives me a lot of information. Or I was working on something and I was taking some heavy um, material and lifting something heavy or Maybe I was just sitting there and I had this weird feeling and the word weird feeling kind of was there and then after that this kind of started happening and then this kind of started happening. Um, did it get worse all of a sudden? Did it just kind of gradually progress? Uh, level of consciousness. So did they lose consciousness? Was it hyperglycemia, hypoxia? Did they have a fall that started all these symptoms? And then what, what kind of other symptoms are they having? If we're doing those sensory motor things, can they see? Can they feel? Can they speak? Uh, motor things like can they walk? Are they, how's their balance? What's their gait look like? Do they have the ability to hold their arms up in front of them? 
Um, some other things that we might think about is their past medical history. Like, do they have AFib? Do they have hypertension? So these are some of the things that we want to make sure that we're assessing initially with our patients. So what are the five most common symptoms of a stroke? So the five most common symptoms, I would suggest that you know these, uh, is sudden confusion or trouble speaking or understanding. So all of a sudden your patient don't know where they're at, or all of a sudden your patient can't get their words out, or you're telling somebody something and they don't understand what you're saying. Uh, the second one would be the sudden numbness or weakness, and this can be in the face, it can be in the arm or the legs. The next one is trouble seeing in one eye or both eyes. Number four would be sudden dizziness, difficulty walking or loss of balance or coordination. And then the fifth most common symptom is a sudden severe headache without a known cause. So I've never had a migraine, but all of a sudden my head is just pounding. I can't believe what's going on. This is the worst headache I've ever had in my life. So those would be the five most common symptoms of a stroke. And there they are. So one of the things that we already mentioned was how important it is that patients get to the hospital and they get to the hospital fast. But if they understand that, they got to understand what to look for as well. So one of the uh, big acronyms or the ways that it has been taught to patients and families on how to recognize the signs of a stroke is using um, either a FAST acronym, F-A-S-T, or either BFAST. And I really like the BFAST because it includes the balance. It also includes the eyes. Whereas if you just do the, the FAST content, it's just that there's facial drooping. Maybe when the patient smiles, one side only moves. Um, the arms droop, so you have them hold their arms out, and then they can't they can't hold one of them, and it keeps falling down. Other one is this the, the speech thing, so we have a hard time actually saying something, or it's very slurred. You may have the patient say a simple simple phrase, you know, like tight dynamite. No, just playing something. Uh, uh, it's cold outside, or something very common. And then the T is the time. So patients, we need to teach patients the importance and family members the importance of calling 911 or getting to a stroke center as fast as possible. So on the NIH stroke scale in your book, go through the NIH stroke scale and just play with it. I don't want you to actually know all the pieces of an NIH stroke scale as far as I'm not going to give you all these signs and symptoms and have you determine what the stroke scale is, but I do want you to understand how the stroke scale works. So are high numbers better or low numbers better? If the patient's getting worse, what's the stroke scale number going to do? Those are the kind of things that I want you to understand when you're looking at the stroke scale. And I do want you to be familiar uh, with what the patients are actually being assessed for. So go back and look over that. I don't think we need to cover all these. I think you can follow this out and then see what number you get at the very end. So when I did this one, pause your video and go do it. I had a total score of 13. So go see what you guys get. So remember the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere control different things. So if we have a stroke that happens on the right cerebral hemisphere, the first thing you'll notice is you'll have opposite side motor deficits. So if it was on the right hemisphere, then that means we would have like left sided weakness. Um, the other thing is if you have right cerebral hemisphere, these patients no longer have that visual spatial awareness, so they um, 
don't know the depth, like who's closer, if we're standing in side by side or if we're standing something that's closer or nearer. They also don't have prior perception, so they can't tell their body position with their eyes closed. Um, these patients are unaware of their deficits, so they don't know they got weakness. So they keep thinking they can get up and go to the bathroom when they totally can't use their whole left side. They're often um, real impulsive, so they'll like just have these outbursts and, and that kind of thing. And then they lack judgment. So this is things that happen for patients on with damage to the right cerebral hemisphere. For the left cerebral hemisphere, that's usually the dominant side because most of us are right-handed and the left side controls our right hand. These patients, well, you, what you're going to see with them is they're going to have um, problems with language. So they'll, they'll have the aphasia. They're also going to have um, things such as alexia. Go back, look up your, your definition. So what would alexia be? The inability to read, that is correct. What about agraphia? What would the patient have if they actually had agraphia? That's right, the inability to write. So that would be the inability to read and write. And then if they had a calcula, they can't do math. So ask them what's two plus two or four plus four. They also may lack the ability to do analytical thinking. So they can't process um, if I get up and go, um, if this happens, then this happens. So if I press the remote control button, then the TV comes on. Or if little things like you can have them say it's raining cats and dogs or something, and they can't really process what that might mean. So that would be the left cerebral hemisphere that was affected. So uh, motor changes, again, are going to be contralateral. So your patient can have either hemiplegia, which is um, complete paralysis to one side of the body, or they can have hemiparesis, which is they just have the weakness on the one side of the body. So hemi means half or one side. So that would be a good thing to remember. They could also, if the brain stem were to be involved, instead of it just being on one side, they may have quadriparesis where they have total body weakness. Now we know that brain stem is pretty important. And so if we have damage to the brain stem, we're going to have cr the cranial nerve deficits. And also we may see some of the respiratory and cardiac complications that go along with the brain stem. And then with the cerebellum, we're definitely going to have gait problems. So thinking about the different parts of the brain and what they control will help you to understand what we may see in these patients. We're going to make sure that we assess for muscle tone. So is the muscle just kind of weak? Uh, is it really, really tight? Um, do they have anosia? Do they have apraxia? So make sure you're, you're assessing for these things. This will be an important thing for you to know what the words mean again, because if I give you a test question and I say, your patient is experiencing a problem with apraxia, how would you educate your patient? Well, if you don't know that apraxia means that they can't you do previously learned um, motor movements, then you're not going to know how to teach this patient. So you really got to know these words. And I gave you guys the list to think about and the ones that you need to study. In. Um, or if the patient has agnosia, what would you, how would, what would be a nursing intervention for a patient with agnosia? You hand them a pencil and they try to brush their teeth with it. Um, there's a problem with that. It's the inability to use things correctly. Some of the sensory changes, there's a picture in your book that actually shows the eyeballs. And it. I think this is the best description of how to understand the, um, the sensory changes that may go along with the eye. So turn to your book and look at that page. But you may have where the patient has total blindness. 
They can have total violence in one eye. They can have bitemporal hemianopsia, which is picture in your book. And in that one, what happens is the outside of both eyes can't see. So that would be where you might have some tunnel vision. You could have um, left homonymous hemianopsia. And that would be where your patient has um, the left side of, of both eyes you can't see out of. So in these patients, you want to make sure that you're approaching them from the side that they can see from. You want to put their tray on the side they can see some. You may need to turn their tray where they can see the whole, uh, everything that's on there. So they don't just see uh, bits and pieces or just half of what they're looking at. But that picture in your book, I think, is the best way to understand those. Patients with stroke may also have cranial nerve involvement. So you may see that these patients are having some problems swallowing. They may be having some difficulty chewing. Uh, they may have some paralysis to their face. So think about what cranial nerves are we looking at or are we thinking about when we look at um, patients that are having a stroke and those five most common symptoms. What cranial nerves might be affected? What's actually causing these patients to experience this? So I'm going to look over again. This goes back to your assessment. You got to know what the cranial nerves are and how they're going to affect different safety mechanisms for your patient. So if you have problems with, say, cranial nerves 9 and 10, your patient can't swallow what well, some precautions you're going to take. So for test questions, I might say the patient had a stroke and they're experiencing difficulty with cranial nerves 9 and 10. What safety mechanisms would you need to put in place? Just an example. Vital signs are super important when we're looking at a stroke. These patients may come in, they might have a blood pressure that's 180 to 200 over 110, 120. Uh, they may have a high temperature just because their body's responded and the metabolic rate has increased, causing them to have a temperature. Well, we already studied and know that that temperature can cause an increase in intracranial pressure. So we gotta make sure that we're taking care of that. Head of the bed, we're going to keep them at 30 degrees. Um, that's to reduce intracranial pressure, but also promote venous drainage and prevent aspiration. For these patients, we're going to try to keep them from flexing their neck and keep them in neutral position. And we're also going to put them in seizure precautions. And we'll talk about that as we go forward uh, in another semester, another um, content area. We'll talk about seizures. We need a lot of help with these patients. It would be so unfair and so unethical even for us to be the think that we could be the sole provider for patients with a stroke. We need everybody on our team. So take a second and think about who would you need for that for our team? Pause the video right now. Who would you want on your team if the patient was having a stroke? And then think about what they would do. And then how many people did you come up with? I hope there's a bunch. Anyway, just something for you guys to think about. Who else would be on our team? Intercollaborative professional care. This is your journal entry. Oh, this is a great example I can put in my journal. A patient had a stroke and we had da 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 here. Be part of your uh, learning outcome in your journal. ABCs are always going to be our priority, so we're going to assess ABCs, and then we're going to do a, maybe a quick cardiovascular assessment. If they have irregular rhythm, having a heart attack, and then we're also going to make sure that these patients go to CT. They get a CT without contrast. We're not going to wait around to see what their kidney functions are. We're not going to wait around and let them drink the contrast. We're not going to wait around for anything. We're going to get that CT. We're going to get it as soon as possible. Uh, we will rule out those um, initial other things like is it hypoxia or is it hyperglycemia or something or hypoglycemia that's causing it. 
but getting that CT is super important. You'll hear them call like a code stroke um, sometimes, and when they call that code stroke, the CT table is getting cleared off. So when we have that CT done, what we're looking for, we're looking to see if the patient actually has a hemorrhage or do they have an aneurysm or do they have the AV malformation? And that will be shown on the CT. When we do the CT checking for ischemia, the first 24 hours, the patients, you're not going to see that patient has ischemia. It's not really going to show up until 24 hours after when you actually can see the changes to the brain. So when you're doing that CT, don't be confused if the patient comes back and they had a CT and it was, they say it's negative. What they mean is the patient doesn't show symptoms of ischemia, but they also don't have um, hemorrhage going on. So that don't mean we don't treat them. We're still going to treat them for a stroke if they meet the stroke criteria using the NIH stroke scale. Also on the CT, you can see if the patient might have had a brain tumor or some kind of hematoma within the brain itself. So just understand a negative CT does not indicate the patient is not having a stroke. So some nursing diagnosis that we might see. Uh, we may see that uh, we could use a nursing diagnosis of inadequate tissue perfusion. And what could we do or what are we going to do for the patient in that actual situation? We may have decreased mobility in that area. So what's some safety things that you might want to think about? Um, who are you going to have on your team? Patients may have aphasia or dysarthria. Don't forget that um, what part of the brain might be affected. So if it's Wernicke's, Wernicke was in what part of the brain? That was you guys. That was the Wernicke area. That's the inability to comprehend speech if that area is affected. Remember the Broca area came from the frontal lobe where you actually produce speech. Remember that was Miss Adams, so we're talking all the time. Um, what's going to be your, your safety precautions for patients that have uh, sensory perception deficits? How are you going to communicate? What are you going to do if the patient has impaired swallowing? Who's going to evaluate them? So look at these diagnoses and kind of think about a care plan. What would be your assessment interventions? What would be your therapeutic interventions? And what would be your teaching interventions? One of our primary goals is to increase perfusion to the cerebral area that's not getting perfused. And we're going to do that with the fibrolinic therapy. That is a weight-based medication um, and it's given IV. Or we could do an endovascular intervention where we actually go in and either remove the clot or give the fibrolinic therapy directly into the clot or put a stent in. Uh, we're going to continuously monitor for increased intracranial pressure, which we've already talked about what that might look like. For communication, remember we're going to use simple commands. We're going to use a picture board. We're not going to use yes, no questions. Um, so in your book, there's a good little section that talks about how are you going to communicate with patients based off what they have. Um, if it's um, the different types of aphasia, what's the best way to communicate with them and that kind of thing. So look back over communication um, with your patients with strokes. <clears throat> um, manage those sensory perceptions. I already mentioned about uh, approaching your patient from the side they can see, you know, have that side toward the door. So they can see patient uh, people coming and going. Also, like if they have like unilateral neglect so that one side they don't see it, they don't know it's there. And so they totally forget to use maybe the right side of their body um, as a sensory as a sensory deficit. They don't see it, so they don't know to use it. So make sure you're continuously reorienting them to um, <clears throat> to that side. You also may need to support that arm, do range of motions in the arms, if the, like if they have uh, flaccidity and that type thing on one side, go through range of motions. Uh, we want to prevent DVTs, provide assistance with their ADLs, help them to be as independent as possible, even though they do have these deficits. <clears throat> 
All right, we're going to talk quickly about, not quickly, but we're going to cover Alteplase, which is your thrombolytic. I would review my best practice box in our book. This is really important to understand. This is a very high risk medication. It's so high risk patients uh, even have to sign a consent to get it. Uh, make sure you're double checking the doses. You got to make sure you use a pump. This can't be on just a, a free hanging drip. You got to make sure you're managing the hypertension. So patients' blood pressures have to be in a certain range before you can actually give it. So review your best practice Houston box for this. Who can't get it? So there are some contraindications for patients that could receive Alteplase. Uh, or TPA, and I'm just going to refer to it as TPA. Um, if they're over 80 years old, that takes them out of being a candidate for it. If they're on any type of anticoagulant, um, if they do uh, imaging and they realize that one third of the brain tissue is supplied by that middle cerebral artery, and the reason for that is such a large area of the brain and if they were to bleed in that area, then you could lose one third of your brain tissue. Uh, if their score is so bad, so if their NIH score is greater than 25, then they're no longer a candidate as well. Or if they have a history of stroke and diabetes. Um, so I want you guys to look at um, the contraindications in your book. Um, other thing is if they've had an active bleed, then they wouldn't be a candidate. Um, think about those things. Look over your contraindications that are listed in your book for exclusions. Okay, so we got a patient. They meet the stroke criteria. They don't have hemorrhagic stroke. We've decided that they need it. We got to figure out the time frame. When was the last time the patient was seen well? So if they went to bed last night, fine they woke up this morning not fine the last time they were seen well was when they went to bed last night um, if you did not see them this morning then when was the last time somebody talked to them and they were well those are very important when was the last time they were seen well um, you have to administer within three to four and a half hours from the onset of symptoms it is weight based the blood pressure has to be less than 180 over 10 automatically so what are we going to do? The patient's in because they're, maybe they're having a hypertensive stroke because blood pressure is so high. Before you give the TPA, you got to get that blood pressure down. Maybe you could give some um, labetadol or nicotapine. You might want to give an IV drip of it. And then we're going to continuously monitor these patients, especially monitoring for a bleed. Some baseline labs that we're going to continuously monitor, of course, are going to be your clotting factors. Um, those vital signs, we're checking that blood pressure. So we know that patients may have a change in their blood pressure. If um, they have a bleed, maybe they could go into shock from losing too much blood. Also for this section, you need to make sure that you don't mix any meds with all the place. It's got to go in a line all by itself. You're going to... Um, if you have any, you're going to do as, as few invasive procedures as absolutely possible for patients that have TPA on board. Like you really want to eliminate any invasive procedures. If you do have to do an ABG, you're going to have to hold for 30 minutes. Um, if you have a bleed, then you're going to have to discontinue the alteplase, the TPA, and you may need to give uh, pat red blood cells or fresh frozen plasma. If the medicine's working too good, like you have excessive fibrinolysis. The antidote for this would be amnicoproic acid. <coughs> so just think about having your um, antidote available. I mentioned earlier that you could do an endovascular procedure. The, the thing with the endovascular procedure is you can actually put the thrombolysis directly at the site of the clot and you have up to six hours to do this whereas for IV alteplase you have to do that within um, three to four and a half hours so it gives you a little bit more of a time frame you can also go in and put a carotid stent in and there is a yellow box in your book that I would look over related to your Cusin concepts of carotid stents um, you're going to make sure that you're still monitoring uh, 
the M, the um, blood pressure and making sure if it gets above 180 that you notify your doctor immediately to give some IV antihypertensives. Of course, you know, when you're doing the blood pressure, you don't want it to be too low because if we get the, the blood pressure too low and we drop our MAP too low, then we're decreasing perfusion to the brain. So um, just basically, we don't want blood pressure to be less than 120 for sure, but we probably want to keep it more closely related to 140 to 150 to try to make sure we're having as much perfusion to the brain as possible. So for the carotid angioplasty, that's just where you go up and you inject the dye and see exactly where the clot is. You can put a stent there. You may, um, you may do this to prevent the patient from actually having the stroke. So this could be a prevention. You could do um, management. So if the patient is having a stroke, you could put the stent in there to open it up and increase blood flow. During that procedure though, something could like uh, break loose. So you wanna make sure you're doing real close neurological assessments during it. And then after, because at that particular time, patients are at higher risk for um, having a, uh, a worsening stroke. After you put the stent in, there's all of a sudden you've had no blood flow and then you got lots of blood flow. And you can have a, a what's called hyperperfusion syndrome where patients have symptoms of um, sudden reperfusion and they have uh, a, a severe temporal headache, uh, severe hypertension. You can even have seizures and neurological deficits. So make sure you're monitoring for that for patients that actually have um, carotid angioplasty and stenting. Ongoing management for patients, they are going to get an aspirin. You don't want to have it uh, on board within 24 hours of the alteplase. So we give the alteplase, say, 10 o'clock today. We don't want to give our aspirin until after 10 o'clock tomorrow. Um, also, they will be on a clopidogrel, some kind of antiplatelet therapy um, for quite some time after having the stroke. So this will be ongoing management. So what are we going to do for um, a hemorrhagic CVA? Really not a lot that you guys are going to need to know other than they'll determine what procedure might be most effective for stopping the bleed. So you got to think about if the patient's bleeding, is it slow that it might stop on its own? Or if it's not slow that you go in and you actually do some procedures that stops the bleeding. But when you stop that bleeding, you decrease blood flow past that area. So it's like you're putting a stop right there. So everything that would have been fed by that vessel now doesn't get perfused. And how detrimental is that gonna to be to your patient? So um, it's kind of really all you need to know. You're not gonna give all to place for this though. You do need to know that. <coughs> Again, we're still going to follow those best practices for intracranial pressure. And, you know, these are the best practices for preventing increased intracranial pressure. And these will be good things to know both for strokes and for patients that are experiencing um, head trauma. I ask you guys to create a care plan for managing impaired swallowing. And these are just some things that I would think about if I were, had a patient that had impaired swallowing. This would be part of your care plan that you should have thought about and created that I mentioned earlier. Same thing's true for your mobility and self-care. So go back and look at what you said you would do for somebody that had mobility issues and see if these were the things that you recommended for these patients. Uh, don't forget, you know, based off the type of aphasia the patient might have, there's receptive or expressive aphasia. Um, how are you going to communicate with them? I talked about this a little bit earlier, but make sure you understand what this might look like. Best communication styles. Uh, so, Joint Commission does have core measures that we have to follow at hospitals, and we want to follow Joint Commission core measures because if we don't, then patients, uh, if we fail at these categories, 
we could potentially lose uh, accreditation and if you don't have joint commission accreditation that means Medicare don't pay you and if Medicare don't pay you you pretty much get shut down so patients need to have some type of VTE prophylactic on board they need to go home on antithrombotic therapy if they got AFib we need to either give them an anticoagulant doctor not us um, at discharge or the doctor needs to have noted why they didn't get one so a patient has too many falls so we don't want to use anticoagulant um, we have to prove that we're using thrombolic therapy within the four hours. So the patient that came to the hospital um, at two o'clock and we didn't give them their um, TPA until nine o'clock that night. Well, that's not good. We're not meeting our joint commission joint, uh, core measures. Um, so anyway, just look over these and kind of understand the importance of um, joint commission core measures and why we need to follow them. So I do have a few questions for you guys to go through and um, to do. I want you guys to just take a minute, pause your video, come up with the right answer. Okay, so the priority intervention for this one is C because you're protecting the airway. Pause your video, answer the question. So it's a left hemisphere stroke. After you pause and come back, we're going to talk about it. Left hemisphere stroke, they have an inability to discriminate words and letters. Intellectual impairment and deficits to the right visual field. So the answers would be B, C, and E. Uh, pause your video, read your question, see what you come up with. Okay, after pausing your video and coming back, hopefully you must understand the eligibility criteria for thrombolytic therapy. And this is seven hours, so definitely would not meet the criteria at seven hours. And then for question number two, before we give any liquids, foods, medications, we have to have a screening by, for swallowing. Um, and then remember who's going to do that. It's going to be speech therapy. Uh, make sure we also check in the gag and cough reflexes. After his swallow screen, they will give us recommendations if he can um, swallow, what kind of foods he can swallow, and how those need to be processed. <coughs> Pause your video, answer your question. And the correct answer would be B. Pause the video. Who are you going to delegate this to? The answer would be C. Ooh, select all that apply. I love select all that apply. You know I do. Um, so experience with a stroke to the left cerebral hemisphere. What would be your answer? Your answers would be A, D, and E. So I did make a little list of things for you guys to make sure you know so you can be prepared for your exam. Make sure you look over all your cues and boxes. Uh, make sure you understand what you're going to teach for a patient and a client with a stroke prevention and post-stroke. What are your important interventions? 
for patients with stroke, uh, what's the reason, and how to use the NIH stroke scale, and make sure you know your pre-class uh, activity term sheet. I wish you guys the best. If you need anything, make sure you reach out and let me know, and I look forward to hearing from you guys. Thanks.